Isometrics are strange because they activate the most muscle fibers and then they're safest because you're not moving. Now, how do they, why do you activate so many muscle fibers? Because when you're pushing against an immovable <clears throat> object, let's say I'm doing a, a, a isometric squat where I get under a bar that I'm not going to lift, I get in good position and I drive as hard as I can for five to 10 seconds. Because the bar is not moving, my body summons a majority of my muscle fibers, then it summons the rest as I continue with this isometric. Do that, then go do your traditional squats. You just feel so supported. Like if you start with isometrics, you're, um, everything that is stabilizing like at another level and uh, you're really in tune with your central nervous system and that same recruitment process you would uh, get from doing an explosive movement. You're just doing it in a, in a more controlled way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that, that same kind of concept applies, but also I've just noticed even more so that my joints felt strong supported, which allowed me to then um, shuttle out even more force. Welcome back. All right, this is the last time I'm going to give away MAPS Cardio, the new MAPS program we just launched, uh, but the final hours. This is the final hours of the launch promotion. It's on sale. You get free stuff with it. So this is the last time I'm going to give it away for free for a long time. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to the Mind Pump Clips channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you. You'll get free access to MAPS Cardio. Okay, so here's the launch that we have a few hours left to take advantage of. The price is going to go from $117 to $77, so there's a discount there. Plus, if you sign up during the launch period, you get two free eBooks: how to boost your VO2 max and how to eat for performance. So just to give you the rundown, $77 gives you MAPS Cardio plus the eBook, how to boost your VO2 max and how to eat for performance. Again, this launch, you have a few hours left as of the posting of this video. So if you're interested, head over to mapscardio.com and then use the code cardio special for the discounted price and the giveaways. All right, here comes the show. Did you know there are proven ways to boost your athletic performance, but they're really weird. That's what we're going to talk about today. Weird <laughs> ways to boost athletic oh, performance. I love weird. What man. constitutes weird here? They're just yeah. not the obvious ones. Okay. Because right? okay. like, of the obvious stuff on how to boost athletic performance. So outside of the box, more like thinking. Yeah. Things that you, you, a lot of people don't realize have pro have been proven in studies to improve uh, athletic performance. You got you stronger, of the, faster. 10 of these for us? 10 of them. Oh, wow. 10 of them. Okay. I wonder, of the 10, how many will actually be weird to people that are like out of the box and how many will be like, oh, I knew that. I, I think that maybe people will listen to them and say, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But then when you look at the studies, it's pretty wild. Like, mm. let's let's start with so the first. backing behind them. Yeah, let's start with the first one. Um, and this one is a, a much bigger athletic performance booster for fitness fanatics than just the average person. And, and I'll explain why in a second. And that is to have some salt. Mm -hmm. Have some salt. Increase your sodium intake. Now, the reason why this makes a big difference with athletes is because athletes or fitness fanatics tend to eat a diet that is not comprised of heavily processed foods. So the sodium intake is lower than the average person. And then you couple that with the fact that they work out and sweat a lot, which means yeah. they excrete a lot of sodium. So supplementing with sodium or salt in your water, or like what we like to use is LMNT. We put that in our water. Better pumps, better strength, better performance, better recovery. It Doug, isn't intra, intramuscular fluid, like it helps with aid in performance totally. uh, quite substantially. Absolutely. How, how big is the electric light market? It's oh, got to be pretty big, huh? Oh, it's it's. I mean, it's, this is. I mean, this is something we've known for a while. I think we've gotten better about the formulations. I right? don't. I think people don't realize it's the sodium that makes the biggest difference. Um, I remember when I first learned mm -hmm. this with endurance uh, clients that I had, where they, I would just tell them to take some Himalayan pink salt, take a pinch, put it in the water. And they were like, oh, my God, this is like the biggest – I can't believe how big of a difference this made in my performance. Yeah, I think uh, as an athlete and, and drinking Gatorade and all – like the thought was like you just – you didn't want to lose too much sweat like as you're out there mm -hmm. in the field. And that was the extent of the electrolyte conversation. So in terms of it being an actual performance boost, I don't think people really realize even with weight training like what that does. Oh, yeah. Me. That it's can't be right. That's I think 32 billion. It's 32. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, he it's he 32 says, it says million. I know, but it's 32,518 million. That means so 32, that's 32 billion. billion. Yeah. It's a billion, uh, billions of dollars. It's a weird way to write it. Yeah. That's a really weird, we're a really weird way to write it. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. That's and huge. Uh, yeah. And, and the other thing too is uh, athletes often, especially people who lift weights, 
we'll eat a lower carbohydrate diet, yeah. which also reduces the amount of fluid and sodium that you have in your body. So in fact, a lot of people going to a ketogenic diet, we'll talk about keto flu. Sometimes it's because their sodium is too low. You have them in introduce sodium into the diet uh, at higher rates and they feel a ton better. So that's, that's one that's is, weird. Now, so is there, is there recent stuff that's came out? Cause what was interesting when Doug pulled that up, uh, not only is it, well, you know, 32 billion or whatever, but it's projected to grow all the way to 56 billion by 2030. So mm. within, you know, the next what six, seven years where they're projecting it to almost double the market. It's uh it's a valuable product that we've been, you know, athletes have kind of known about it for a while. Here, I'll read a study to you. Check this out. So this is, uh, uh, this was a, in science news, the effectiveness of salt on sports performance in triathletes is what they evaluated. The athletes who added supplement, uh, this supplement of salt to their usual hydration routines during the competition took 26 minutes less to complete a medium distance triathlon course. 26, 26 minutes, minutes less. Wow. That's a huge, and, and close. Yeah. That's a massive impact. And I remember when we, when we first started working with LMNT, I'm not an endurance athlete, uh, but I did it with my workouts and I was like, whoa, the pumps are way better. Yeah. And it's this. so counter to what people perceive salt as being this evil addition that just for flavor uh, and it's going to spike their uh, hypertension and, you know, blood pressure issues as a result of that. And I think that, you know, we're just now coming around and realizing salt plays a, a pretty big factor in, in movement and uh, any kind of like athletic pursuit. Okay, that's weird number one. What's weird number two? Pick an awesome music pl playlist. Now, people, <laughs> I know it sounds funny because people like listening to music, <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if you guys really, I'll pull up a, a study on this. I don't know if you guys realize just how big. It if, no, it definitely affects it for sure. It's, it's a big impact. It's a lot more than than uh, than people realize. Um, there's. I mean, I think, you know, I think maybe you may not realize it, but subconsciously you have to kind of know, right? Okay, like you have... Uh, like how how much does music play a role in like your emotions? Like when you watch a movie, right? very true. Ma imagine watching a movie, scary movie, and uh, like a heroic movie, and you cut out the musical part. It, oh, like, yeah. have you ever have you ever seen them do that before? It like totally Sucks. ruins it, the movie. It kills it. It just shows you what an impact that it makes on you emotionally, right? Well, one study showed a fifteen percent improvement in endurance. Fifteen percent. Oh, wow, that's a big. Just from music, no change in diet, no change in training, just music alone. An equal percent uh, reduction in pain perception mm -hmm. was also shown in other studies with music. So that's a big difference from music oh. alone. And music is like it's not even it's not again it's it just you're right it affects emotion, it affects perception, and that affects your performance. But fifteen percent, like name a supplement. That has been shown to improve athletic performance by fifteen percent. Yeah, no, that's yeah. A, that's another great one. Throw right? Pantera on, and I don't feel any pain. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It, it, it's weird though how that. I guess there's got to be such an individual variance though how that would work, right? Because I've always thought it's crazy that people get hyped on like hip hop. Like I love hip hop music. I just I listen to it all the time. Doesn't but, do it for you. But yeah. doesn't do it for working yeah. out. Like yeah. for working out well, wise, for parties. Yeah, I need I need Justin's type of music, your type of music for working out. If I'm getting after, it. like if I'm trying to cruise yeah. and I actually don't want to improve performance in the gym, yeah, yeah. I might listen well, to hip hop or country. Well, reading articles on this, uh, part of it is, uh, a big part of it is the association you have with the music. So like mm. for me, yeah. uh, and you guys are going to laugh, but obviously if I work out to like a Rocky soundtrack, because <laughs> as a kid growing up watching that movie, that was such a, you know, impactful movie for me. And you had the montages. Which of Rocky. one is it? Is it the eye of the tiger or is Any it of them. the opener? Any of them. But Rock, Rocky four is my favorite. The, the montage is on there where he's running up the, uh, the mountain and Drago and do all that. I feel like that movie has, has created so many emotions for you that you'd almost be like confused in the gym with that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Am I turned on he right now? Crying, Am I hyped? Crying. 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 On. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I'm horny or I'm like ready to work out. Play that with like, my wife. Yeah. I don't know, babe. My performance isn't that good. You know, I don't know how yeah. I feel right now. Oh, you have the time. You got to right, pick the mine. right playlist. I mean, yeah. That's the point. Here. Let's do it. We're going to have a lot of fun. That's a good one, though. Yeah. I like that as a weird one. All right, what's number three? What's uh, the third weird one? Train in the afternoon. So studies on okay. the best time of day to work out. Now, of course, We've talked about this on the show before. The best time of day that you can work out ultimately is the, the time that you're going to be the most consistent because at the end of the day, that's what matters. Yeah. But if you want to boost performance, studies show consistently people are stronger. They can run faster, longer, just have more everything. Better performance across the board by working out like around 
uh, early afternoon, one o'clock, two o'clock. Because you're like seven. fully acclimated, everything's turned on, and like all your systems are go. Yeah, I would think. I would think they also nutrition. Like you probably you, some food. you probably have a uh-huh. meal or two inside you, which I would think makes the biggest difference. Yeah, I think that makes more of a difference than it actually being noon or one when you're getting your lift in is that you've been up early enough that you've already had at least one, if not two meals. And so your body's fueled. Yeah. I know for me, it makes, I mean, my early afternoon workouts, if I want to hit a PR Mm -hmm. or I really want to like, uh, you know, push it and see what I can do. I'm the best right around like a couple hours after lunch. So Mm -hmm. for me, it's around two o'clock. So I'll eat lunch at noon, give a little bit of digest, have some digestion and then hit the gym. I work out early in the morning just because yeah. that's when I can be most consistent, which also happens to be the worst time for performance. Yeah. Um, but it might, it's consistent for me. But yeah, if I want to like lift heavy and train uh-huh. my hardest, it's around that there time. Right a lot there. of nostalgia there because that period that it was between clients, typically you had that kind of break in the afternoon. Isn't that funny? That's yeah. true. Yeah. And, or when I was in school, that was when I had like, you know, break between classes. And again, my workouts were, uh, way different than they are today <laughs> but it's just you got to do what you got to do to be consistent yeah is that the best time for you guys still now oh it's yeah, yeah no it's such a difference for me that it's hard for me to do the other other times it really is it takes a lot for me to be motivated to get up early in the morning or it takes a lot if it's already like five six o'clock and i'm gonna go out there and go get it i really have to be on a kick where i'm like i have a goal in mind that i'm trying to achieve and i'm like i've already committed i'm not missing a day Otherwise, I find myself talking myself out of it if I can't make my noon noon to two somewhere in that yeah. range. And for me, it's it's been it's more about food. And I've noticed that from like you know training and tracking so much. It's like oh, when I have two meals, if I got breakfast and a lunch in me, I'm I'm fueled up. Even just having breakfast and then say working out at like say ten thirty or eleven, not as good of a workout. I need that second meal to really load all the way up before I feel good. Yeah. Now this next one doesn't really have any studies to support it that I can find. So this is going to be anecdote um, that I've experienced myself. And I've also experienced training other clients and just managing gyms. Um, And this, this is probably more true for a fitness fanatic and that's to work out in a brand new place. I mean, of course it depends on the kind of place, but I know for me, if I, when we've done shows where we've traveled and there's a new gym that we're near, either there's that one in Reno we went to, or there's, you know, Ben Pakulski's facility, or there's that one, you know, powerlifting gym. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. It was in Texas. And it was uh-huh. amazing. Maybe we can, if someone can Big remember that. Big text. Big text. Yeah. Yeah. Great gym. I, we actually went in there to film. In fact, I know all of us stayed up late the night before, all felt like crap, um, and we all decided to work out that day, if you recall, because yeah. it was just a new place. It was different. It's exciting and fun. Lots of energy. It was very inviting, and yeah, it's it, it just kind of it it brings new interest in, into the workout itself, and you kind of bring the fun back. Into it's the it. novelty of it. Yeah, I, I absolutely think. I mean, it's, I, you it, actually you did this on, on purpose. You had like memberships to so many different gyms. Yes. I totally would do that. If I was not motivated to go to one, I'd go to the other one like that. So, I, and, and, and I, different mindsets, I wanted to be in different ones. So if I was like, it was a kind of a chill, like I didn't, I, this is, didn't need to be an intense workout. It was more of a, like a recovery. I'm going over to club sport with a steam room and sauna, a oh, right. little bit slower pace in the gym. If today was like, I'm getting after it. It's a heavy deadlifting day. I'm going to go golds where all the dudes are lifting really heavy. Eh, today's kind of touch weight, kind of aesthetic stuff like that. I'm going to go over into my 24 hour fitness gym where there's a lot of machines and stuff. So I, I mean, I absolutely, I love this along these lines and you didn't have it on your, your weird tips, but you could also throw in there, uh, changing the, the workout. That, sure. I mean, that, that, that partially does it. And, and I think it's the no- in a new place. We'll yeah. Do that too. Yeah. New place, either a new place or a new workout gives you that kind of novel stimulus mm-hmm. and just excited. Oh, it's something new, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's an, just the same feeling you get with anything. That's, well, that's new. part of it for me. When I work out in a new place, I almost always do different exercises because mm-hmm. there's new machines, different pieces of equipment. So I typically don't go to a new place and do the exact same routine usually changes things up for me. So that, that's probably a big uh, part of it. Here's another one. And I love this when I have this opportunity. I don't get it very often these days. You know, I have a, I'm a father of three kids. I have a fourth one on the way. Obviously, we have this business. But when this happens to me, I freaking love it. When I have twice as long to work out as I normally do, I do the same workout. 
I just rest twice as long and I take twice as long. And I have some of my best workouts. I, I love do. this yeah, this no tip. Pressure. I love this tip because uh, it it doesn't happen all the time, but there I you know there'd be times where I would get this where it's like oh I have nothing on the agenda today. It's a Saturday. I'm gonna get in the gym when it's not really busy in there. And I'd sometimes be in there for two to four hours. Yeah. Even break it up with like a shake in between to refuel a little bit, then go back at it. And it wasn't that I was doing a ton of volume. It's just I was taking my time in there. And it and it just in enjoying the process of being in there. I think that in itself, I think, it, and because again, back to the kind of novel thing, I think you get from this too because you don't get to do that all the time. I used to love doing this. Yeah, but I also think it's the double rest periods. Like if you rest, sure, uh, you know, a minute and a half in between your sets, and you go from a minute and a half to three minutes or four minutes, you're going to be stronger. Well, you perform better. Yes, that's just the thing. You're you're not battling any fatigue or any urgency to. Uh, get to the next it's whenever your body feels really ready to go again so it's it's a nice change of pace now the key to this is you're not working out twice as much i want to be clear working out twice as much is not what i'm saying what i'm saying is same sets same reps everything the same except you're probably gonna go heavier because you're stronger you just take twice as long literally sit there and rest twice as long as you normally would and then watch what happens to your performance and watch how you feel the day after and how your your body responds from that. Mm -hmm. All right, this next one's really interesting because there were these studies on, uh, you know, what's called post activation potentiation, or studies that show that going heavy and then doing explosive movement, or doing explosive movement and then going heavy, this combination tends to activate more muscle fibers. So if you're somebody that's got some experience and you can do plyometrics, try doing five to ten minutes of plyometrics for your target body part. And the way plyometrics work is you don't go to failure. It's not a fatigue-based type of routine. It's literally about how fast and explosive as you can be. Mm -hmm. Do five or six explosive, for example, push-ups, then rest a few minutes, and then do it again. Even if you could do 20, just do five or six and push as hard as you can. Then go do your normal controlled bench press. Watch how the muscles feel. It's the ultimate recruitment uh, protocol, right? Yeah. So it's like I can summon the troops as many muscle fibers as possible uh, early on that you can then pull from throughout your workouts. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, feeling once you once you nail it down in terms of like being able to be explosive and then go into your strength training. Yeah. Well, would you, okay. Would, in this same point, would you also throw in like doing like a, a heavy grinding set before you go do something? For example, like one of my favorite things to experiment with, I remember the first time I connected this, uh, was it was like a day where I really want to get after pull-ups and going and doing just one or two really heavy reps on like a deadlift and then go over and do body yeah. weight pull-ups. Have yeah. you ever done that before? It's a tension. Oh, it's insane. Yeah. It's yeah. insane how all this, how light your body weight feels after you go pull something close to your max weight. And you're not trying to do fatigue. You're not doing four or five sets. I'm just going to do one or two sets of one to two pulls That's of it. a really heavy weight and then go over to pull-ups. And my pull-ups, I just feel like my body weight so is So I think similar. it's similar too. I think because what explosive reps do is you summon a lot of muscle fibers because of the force and the speed uh, that you're trying to accomplish. But with a really heavy lift, you're doing something very similar, right? Mm -hmm. You're summoning more muscle fibers and then they're turned on. Then you go do your normal workout and, and you're just more connected to everything. So what I'll do with this is I'll, I like bands for explosive uh, uh, movements, bands or medicine balls. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do with bands, for example, let's say it's back day, is I'll take a good heavy band, put it on something that's anchored really well, and I'll do five or six you know, explosive rows. Now the explosive, the explosive part is the pull. The, the, I, I'm more controlled when I when I come back, but it's I come back with the explosive row, come back, and I'll do like five or six of those. I'll do like two sets. Then I'll go do my normal rows, and it's like everything is turned on. The pump is crazy. I'm stronger. It's really, it's really weird. This reminds me. It's it's kind of funny because just intuitively, uh, when I was in high school, I used to do this ritual before I'd bench press, and this was when I would bench like the most. Was well in college, I bench more, but um, I used to do this thing that my friends used to make fun of me for, where before I get down, I would do these really fast, explosive movements oh, like this. Turn everything on. Yeah, and and I was just literally like as fast and as explosive as I could because I just knew it feel it felt like I had more to give uh, once I got to the bar, and so it was like pretty much like that intuitively you knew it, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, really interesting. Mm. All right, so the next look one, dorky, I'll be the honest. next one. Okay, the next one has. Tons and tons of literature supporting it. It's actually one of the more studied forms of resistance training, and that's isometrics. Isometrics 
are, okay, explosive movements, great. They turn on lots of mu muscle fibers. The risk factor with explosives out, uh, movements tend to be high. Isometrics are strange because they activate the most muscle fibers and then they're safest because you're not moving. Now, how do they? why do you activate so many muscle fibers? Because when you're pushing against an immovable <clears throat> object, let's say I'm doing a, a, a isometric squat where I get under a bar that I'm not gonna lift, I get in good position and I drive as hard as I can for five to 10 seconds, because the bar is not moving, my body summons a majority of my muscle fibers, then it summons the rest as I continue with this isometric. Do that, then go do your traditional squats and watch how you feel. This was a favorite amongst the, the Eastern Bloc nations during the, the, the reign of the Soviet Union when it came to strength sports. And it was a great way for them to, and it shows in the studies, you build more muscle and you build more strength. One this. crazy thing with this, you just feel so supported. Like if you start with isometrics, you're, um, everything that is stabilizing, like at another level and, uh, you're really in tune with your central nervous system and that same recruitment process you would, uh, get from doing an explosive movement. You're just doing it in a, in a more controlled way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then that, that same kind of concept applies, but also I've just noticed even more so that my joints felt strong supported which allowed me to then um shuttle out even more force well especially when it's focused it focused on the target muscles that we're, we're trying to really light up right well, that's it i feel like like yeah, it's more targeted i feel like most people's um experience with isometrics in the in the gym world is planks Everybody has seen planks. Yeah. Planks are really it, like, and so people hear isometrics mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, I'm going to start doing planks again before my workout, which is nothing wrong with that. I think that's okay to do do planks, but I think it, a very focused, targeted uh, isometric hold on something that you are getting ready to go activate and work is even more beneficial. And I would actually lump in this this part of the conversation our priming too, right? Would mm -hmm. you not put that? Oh, here? yeah. Well, priming is is, uh, is, is somewhat asymmetric. So yeah, that's exactly what it is, right? Yeah. So when, we, when, we are, when we're priming the body to get ready for these workouts, that's what MAPS Prime is and Prime Pro all about is is we're trying to wake up all those the, all those areas, right? Normally it's around a joint that we're trying to work on mobility and stuff in, but same concept of getting ready for that, right? Yeah, so like, for example, let's say you're going to work your back. One thing you could do is you could do a pull up where you pull yourself up and then hold yourself at the top and squeeze your back as hard as you can, squeeze your hands as hard as you can for like five to 10 seconds and then let go. There you go right there. And then you go rest and then you go and you do your back workout. Watch how you feel, right? You can do this for biceps. I could take a preacher curl machine, curl up a heavy weight, squeeze it as hard as I can at the top for five to 10 seconds. The idea is really to summon a lot of force. Then you rest and then you go do your exercise. Or what if you want it? It's your glutes. Do a hip bridge. Do a hip bridge. Squeeze your glutes as hard as you can for you know ten seconds, fifteen seconds. Then go do your barbell squats. Watch how you feel after you do that. It's a very interesting, strange feeling. You feel more turned on, more connected to the muscle that you're trying to target, especially when you do it in the shortened position. So one little uh, thing I'd like to add to this is if you have a weak body part, like a body part that doesn't respond, that's where I would place this focus. Isometrics before your traditional workout on your weak body parts is a great way to get you connected to those weak body parts, especially in the shortened position, shortened meaning fully contracted. So like it would be like a, a squeeze here for pecs or a squeeze here for rows, that type of deal. Or doing like a floor bridge where you squeeze your butt before you go do squats. Right, That's a right. common one that I would, I would help like a client who says they do squats and do the deadlifts, do these exercises that are great for the glutes, but feel like they can never feel it in their glutes. So getting that client on like a floor bridge and doing a squeeze or a hip bridge, right? And squeeze at the top, really do an isometric hold for five seconds on the glutes, do that a couple times, and then take them over to the squat. Watch how much more they have, uh, have a better time. Two ways that I glutes. really experienced this uh, before. One was overhead carry uh, before shoulders. So I would take the kettlebells or dumbbells, put them up and above us, you know, and straighten my arms out really, really tall. And then I'd walk, which is essentially an isometric for my upper body, right? And then I would go do my traditional shoulder workout and I was stronger. I just was stronger in my lifts. The other one was a farmer walk. Farmer walk, yes, you're walking, but a lot of it in the upper body, if not all of it, is isometric. I'm holding and maintaining good posture and I'm keeping everything tense. Then I would go do my deadlifts or my rows or whatever, and I was just stronger. Everything was just more turned on. I got a better pump um, you know, from, from doing that. So the next one, this one's really interesting, uh, and that is to get cold before you do your workout. So studies will show that when you're when you're somewhat cold 
before your workout. Now, you don't want to be cold during your workout because that makes things a little bit different. But if you go into a workout feeling a bit chilly and cold, you see uh, because your body's able to regulate its temperature a little bit better, you see increased and improved performance and longevity. You can work out longer. Now, obviously, the opposite is we've all experienced. You get too hot, you cut the workout short. Do you know what the research says on how much that affects it? Because I actually felt a dramatic difference in that when I first was introduced to cryotherapy. Oh, that's right. So when we first started the podcast was when uh, cryotherapy was getting really popular um, and we had a friend that had had one and I got the opportunity to use it. And I remember he was, it was Dr. Brink, right? A good friend of ours. And he told me, he's like, I was actually using it more like a recovery thing. I'd go there after a workout or I'd go just try it out on an off day. Um, and he's like, you know, what you need to do is try this before you left one day. And I'm like, before that seems weird. And I was like, he's like, no, watch how you feel, man. And I, I only got a chance to do it like a handful of times, like maybe four or five it's times. Like, it feels like caffeine almost. It, it is. I, the workout where they were some of the most amazing workouts I've ever felt. I, I, I mean, and I don't know if that's because of how, how much it brings all the inflammation down, plus the adrenaline mm -hmm. rush that you get from being super cold. Uh, maybe it's the combination of those two things. I don't know what, what the research says on why it's so effective, but that's to me, that's what makes sense, right? You Something getting super cold like that, you're going to bring down any sort of inflammation that you have going on in the body, plus you get this massive like energy spike like when you go into a cold plunge because you're getting that cold. Mm -hmm. And that adrenaline rush combined with inflammation being done, I would not only did I have the energy, but my body felt good. Like mm -hmm. I just, I, I almost, even though I'm cold, I felt warmed up before going into the workout. Well, I definitely have heard, and we talked about this a bit with that study with um, putting a, a sleeve over your hand that would cool you down. How yes. weird was that? Mid um, competition. So it extended the ability a lot of these athletes had to then compete at a high level because they were regulating their body temperature and bringing it back down. And it was very much related just to their core temperature. Yeah. What was that? Do you remember? Andrew Huberman did the, did a study. And it was like a crazy, it difference. is a cra it was like eight times more volume. It was a ridiculous. It amount. was dips, right? Body weight dips. Yeah. It, it was like, something like that. Was way more reps. Yeah, wait, like eight times. Yeah, it wasn't even. It wasn't like three more reps. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was uh, like a crazy amount of more that he could do by just simply putting his hand in that. So super fascinating. So yeah, I'm, I bet I'm sure a Andrew Huberman has. I, we still, I know, do to get. I know, we'd love to have him on to explain this. Yeah, further. yeah, no, we, I know we have. I know we have plans to. I don't know when we are, but I mean that that uh, was super fascinating. So I'm not even familiar with uh, all the different mechanisms that are at work that cause it. I just remember firsthand playing with it and being like, whoa. This makes a huge yeah. difference. The only thing that I could think of was, okay, it's bringing down all the inflammation, plus I'm getting this adrenaline rush from my body being so cold. The combo of those two things, one makes my body feel so good and recovered and loose and ready to, to work out. The other one's got my adrenaline going. The combination of that just, it, it resulted in an incredible, agree. incredible I, workout. I would agree with that. All right, the next one, this is, a, of course, a more of a psychological phenomenon, but that is to bring a work, uh, workout friend. Now, it depends on the friend that you bring, right? Don't bring your lazy friend <laughs> or the one that's going to make you know how to be selected, just like your your playlist. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. but bring bring a friend who you know you you know you're going to have a fun time working out with. This right here is interesting. I don't work out with workout partners uh, for the most part, but I will say some of my best performing workouts were ones where the the random rare occasion I work out with like two or three people. Right, mm -hmm. we're all working out together. We're having fun. A little bit of competition sets in and everything gets more exciting and I feel stronger and I can push myself more. Um, and my performance, my performance just yeah. gets gets better. Or you could get a bunch of uh, high school students to clap for you after you every rep. That's, you know, that's, 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 that helps. <laughs> Did they clap after every rep? <laughs> yeah, they're like, whoa! <laughs> Cheering me on, like I'm just you know squatting. You know, I, I I rag on the 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 workout partner probably the most out of all of us because I'm 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 big on solo working out. But I will say there was something that I do remember that I liked about having a partner. I actually like the timing of having a partner it automatically kind of builds in like a really nice rest period. Oh, you just go so, back so and just forth. go, go. The whole thing is go. Like it's yeah. like, I feel like, but your, your, your rest are built in because the other guy's got to go between and then you got to get ready for mm -hmm. the set right afterwards. So it does present like a really nice flow and consistency with rest periods. Excuse me, having a, a workout partner. So I do like that aspect yeah. of it. I remember uh, we haven't worked out together except for maybe a handful, literally a handful of times. But there was early days. You guys remember it was a workout. It was at the place that you trained at. Yeah. Way back. And we were in the North grass. Cal. 
and we were, and all of us were like picking exercises. So I think we, we like, we did some sleg drags and I think that was just someone to do that. Of we course, deadlifts, dead cause that's my favorite thing. And yep. we were, we were doing different mm-hmm. things and using bands and chains and it was a really Armor fun walks. and no way I would have worked out like that on my own. So I'm pretty sure my performance improved. Uh, that was a was fun a, one. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. This next one, what I, I, you know, I learned this as a kid just because my first, you know, gym or weight set was in my parents' backyard. Now it was in the backyard under like a patio overhang, right? So I'm kind of outside, but kind of not. But then I remember, I don't know, this is early on, right? So it's like the, within the first few months of working out, it was sunny outside. It's in the summer and I would take the barbell and I'd walk out to the sun on the lawn and I'd work out outside and I loved the way that I felt. Um, this goes all the way back to like Muscle Beach, right? Muscle Beach is one of the first well-known bodybuilding gyms. I mean, that place goes all the way back to the 1940s. It was on, or maybe even before, it's on Venice Beach and you had bodybuilders working out outdoors in the sun. And some of them said that that was their best workout. So I love sometimes, obviously, if the elements aren't too crazy, I love training outside. It gives me a totally different feel and it does improve and help my performance. And I've done this with clients too. I've had it where clients come in and, you know, we've been working out oh. for a long time or whatever. And I'll say, Hey, meet me at the park. I'm going to take a kettlebell and a medicine ball. They for sure. It. There's a massive psychological component to it. You know, I, there, I love working out outside uh, just because it just, it brings this new energy, this new stimulus. Um, and too, I think it's something about like the fresh air and the sun and all that, that kind of, uh, it, it sparks movement. For the most part, I think being like indoors without, you know, any moving air and under our artificial lights, a lot of times that can kind of dampen the energy and bring things down. I think even if you don't have the luxury to go train outside or there's not equipment out there, you don't have kettlebell or whatever. I actually even think just going for a walk right before a workout, you can reap some of those benefits. Yeah, good yeah. point. So sure. like something's really common here, right? So, uh, and today will be one of these days. Um you know, everyone will take off after we podcast and go their separate ways. Today, I'll stay in the gym uh, and I'll work out. But we've been in here all day long and like just going out there, it's really tough for me to get into this. So I'll actually sometimes go walk our block mm. like two or three times. Like maybe it's like a, a mile, you know, of walking outside, just the fresh air, the sun, and that'll rejuvenate me and it'll it'll prep me for my workout. And I swear I get more versus if I just go out there right now and try to get into the workout, I won't have as good of a workout. So even if you can't train outside, I think that's a small hack in itself, especially if you have a job where you're like under fluorescent lights, you're indoors all day long, and then you drive to the gym, the gym is inside also, like actually taking a nice little walk for like 10 minutes well, outside, absorbing the sunlight, fresh air, go in, I bet you get a well, better Well, the workout. studies on productivity, because of the circadian rhythm and exposure to the sun, like they show that if you have a desk next to a window, yeah. so you, you get some sun exposure, productive, right? you're more productive. Yeah. You also sleep better. Um, so, you know, opening the sunroof in your car, there's studies I'll show when you drive, opening the sunroof in your car will contribute to better, better sleep and, uh, better productivity. So it does make a big difference. In fact, my dream, I think I've to- told you guys this and you guys thought it was a great idea. My dream of you know one day, if I ever own a gym just for fun, not, not to make money, but just for fun would be to have a gym with a retractable ceiling roof. I would love yeah. to be able to hit that'd a button, be sick. pull this, pull the roof back. It's sunny outside, maybe in California, like we are here. And we could just work out in the sun. Just gotta I think, watch out for the random bird that flies by. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the only thing. Yeah. <laughs> it poo- you're doing you're doing <laughs> like a max rep. You're doing like a max <laughs> rep, and it hits one side. Oh, Brace for your mouth open. Yeah. Oh, oh terrible. Oh. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> Damn you. Anyway, look if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. You can find Adam on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right. 